ACT UP is made possible in part by the West Virginia Humanities Council. I'm not a star, not yet anyway. I was nervous at first, but then it was great. Well, me and Bonnie grabbed each other's shoulders and jumped up and down and said, finally, and we screamed and stuff. Surprised you didn't hear us. <laughs> they went berserk when the curtain closed. They, were, they are so happy. They know they did a fantastic job. We worked on this play for around four months. It was called The Broken Bow, and it was about children who lived during the early 1900s. Back then, children didn't have any rights, and they were very poor. And they got paid very little because they were young and they didn't know. It was very sad. In the play, there were 14 kids and five adults. It was really neat to be in the play because it was for kids, about kids, and starring kids. When I said we were in a play, it's just not like any other play. We did have lines to speak. I don't get paid for the glass that breaks, and I can't drop in either, or it gets took from my pay. But there was also dancing. Some of us played adults, um, we wore masks and did sign language, and then other w adults would say our voices. Not big enough. What do you all want? A hotel? I go to Pleasant Hill Grade School in Calhoun County, West Virginia. The towns are small, and the roads are really windy. In October, Mrs. Cunningham, my homeroom teacher, told me about a play. Drew Bender was directing it, and she's a dance teacher in town, and she was looking for kids who wanted to act and dance and be in a play. When Jude's place, the Hartwood Dance Center, opened, it was the only place in the whole county that had theater classes for kids. Jude was having auditions to see which kids could be good actors. Since I had never been in a play before, I thought I'll try it. Why not? As it turned out, we all got into the play because Jude said we all had talent. There were 14 kids in the play, and two of them were from Clo, and that's like an hour away. The rest were from my school, so I've seen them around before. We started going to Hartwood three days a week after school. We start with waving, waving big, all right? And with the other arm, you wave, okay? Then what do we do? Anybody remember? No, not yet. Okay. Waving the basket. Okay? You make a basket with your arm. You dip your fingers down into that basket. You pull up and you throw it away and you come back. We do it four times. Okay? Now, during all of this stuff, you can loosen up your knees, all right? Let your knees be soft. Okay? Then we go to the other side. All right? That's right. Then we look.
During the warm ups, we would pretend to be looking through a telescope and other things to imagine stuff that wasn't there. After the warm-ups, we would run across the room, leaping and jumping. That was really fun. We're getting ready to do a play, to perform in front of an audience. Okay? My job is to teach you how to do that so that you do a really good job. Your job is to come here and be here and do the work. Okay? We have too many kids in this play. <coughs> because you all did so great on Sunday that I wanted you all in it. But you're going to have to work really hard because none of you could do it now. You're going to have to learn how to do it. And I've worked out a whole system to teach you how to do it. But the only way that I can teach you is to have you completely here with me. All right? Completely. Okay, put your hands right by your eyes like this. And push your hands forward like that. Like blinders on a mule, this is concentrate, okay? You come here, you concentrate, you do what I ask you to do, and you'll be in the show and you'll do a good job, a great job. Get yourself to calm down and put all your energy into the acting, okay? Go. Look. We did one exercise where we were supposed to be frightened Slow. and then run away. Really, really scared. Dude said that we had to tell the truth with our eyes. Look, here's some light. Now you can look around. What do you see? What do you see? Is everything... Jude told us a lot about acting. She said it was a different way of... You open up a whole new world to yourself. To act, we had to work on our voices to make them loud and clear so the audience would understand what we said.
watch our step. We played this game to practice our lines called Keep Calm, and it was like a musical director where they have to follow the conductor where he moves his hands and stuff, and like we had to say the words with her hands. A game that I liked was going to California. We would all sit in a circle, and we had to remember what the person before us said, and like after the half of the circle, it got really hard to remember. When I go to California, I'm going to take my horse. When I go to California, I'm going to take my horse and my suitcase. <sighs> when I go to California, I'm going to take my horse, my suitcase, my cat, my bike, my skateboard, my TV. <laughs> <laughs> She'd always play music when we did our exercises, and we practiced stepping or clapping to the beat. As weeks went by, the steps got harder and harder, and you really had to pay attention to do all the steps right. At first, I didn't really know what she meant by the beat. I couldn't really step on the right time. I would try, but I couldn't really get it. She kept on saying, keep to the beat, keep to the beat, but it was hard. After a while, things did get easier, and that's what happened to everything that was new to me. All right, all right, a beautiful spine. Yes, we're all going to do it right now. This is the girl that I played. She worked 10 to 12 hours each day, and she got 55 cents for it. Her name is Pearlie Turner. She looks very tired and that's how she made me feel when I saw her. We started going to Hartwood a lot, usually five days a week. And once we were there, we started doing what we call blocking, placing ourselves in the dances so we wouldn't knock each other over. Hooray, hooray, come join the Jubilee. Hooray, hooray, come march to make us free. So we'll sing a song again, a song of liberty. Okay, now hold it, hold it. In your peripheral vision, my dear, you should check her out. She's Everybody, well, something is wrong. These two are in a line, and you are in and you are out. Sometimes we would have dinner there and keep rehearsing until eight or nine. We got to know each other really well at Hartwood. The performance was going to be soon, and we had to know our parts and dances and music all by heart. We had been practicing for months, and we were really tired, but it was exciting. Putting on a show is more complicated than it looks, but it's a lot of fun. A lot of fun. What did you do to die today at a minute or two, two, two? A thing distinctly hard to say, but harder still to do. For the reason that two at twenty two two are Two, 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 two
made possible in part by the West Virginia Humanities Council. looking at old photos, especially ones of my mom and dad. They wore clothes that look weird to us, but I guess at that time, they were wearing the latest thing. Here is Christmas at my grandmother's house. My family really has some old photos. When you look at old photos, you wonder about the people. What were they like? My favorite photos are of kids my own age. What was it like to be a kid in 1950? In 1930? In 1900? We all love looking at old photographs. They give us a glimpse of the past. It's a moment of truth from another time. We can tell how people lived. We can tell by the way that they dressed and the expressions on their faces. But a photograph can only tell us just so much about people and about a time. And the rest that we have to fill in with our imagination which makes it even more wonderful. Some years ago, I was given a book by a friend as a gift, and in that book, there were photographs by a man named Lewis Hine. He was a very caring man, and he believed in social justice. He made himself available to organizations that were working for social change. The National Child Labor Committee was just such an organization. They were working to persuade the federal government to make laws that would protect children. From the year 1790, when the first cotton mill was opened in the United States, very young children were being employed in jobs that were dangerous for them, jobs that they should not have been doing. Children worked in many, many different kinds of industries. They worked in mills where cotton was woven. They would stand in dimly lit rooms with the roar of machinery all around them at dangerous tasks. Sometimes they would get very badly hurt by the machines. Boys were hired to work in the mines. They would sit across chutes where the coal would come pouring down and they would pull pieces of slate and dirt out of the coal or they went down into the mines themselves and sat by doors in the dark to open and close the doors for 10 hours at a time. Out on the streets, children would sell newspapers or they would deliver messages and telegrams, sell candy or beg for pennies or odd jobs. Many of these children were homeless and they lived out on the street. Or their families were so poor that without the child working, the family wouldn't survive. Most of the children never learned how to read. Now you might think that that's a neat thing, that kids could stay out on the street all day and not go to school. But if you think about it, 
even if school sometimes isn't very much fun, one of the wonderful things that you're learning is how to read. These children, these working children, had no choices about their future. They were not being prepared to grow up, to be healthy, productive adults. The more I saw of Lewis Hines' photographs of children, the more I wanted to see, and the more I wanted to bring them to life in a theater piece. I found out that all of the photographs that he took for the National Child Labor Committee were available on microfilm and put them through a machine. I spent two days at the library going over the microfilm and watching thousands of children pass by. It was extraordinary. Lewis Hine had written captions and notes for most of these photographs. And from those captions and notes and notes from other sources, I was able to put together the lives of 14 children. And I gave those 14 lives to the children at Hartwood who were working with me on Broken Bow. This is caption 1882, December 1910, London, Tennessee. This little girl, like many others in the state, is so small she has to stand on a box to reach her machine. She is regularly employed as a knitter in London. The boys at Silas Fish Mine, Turkey Knob Mine, McDonald, West Virginia, Tipple Boy. We're going to find more. August 1908, McDonald, West Virginia. Abby Laird. She's 12 years old. She's a spinner. North Pormo Cotton Mill. The girls in the mill said that she's 10 years old. She admitted to me she was 12. As we worked on Broken Bow, I began receiving in the mail envelopes from friends across the country with articles about child labor abuses in the United States and worldwide. It was incredible for us to realize that something that we had thought was a story about the past was actually a story about the present and that child labor is a current problem that everybody needs to think about and work to stop. After all the research was done and I had facts, I had statistics, I had an idea of what had actually happened to people. Then I had to make theater out of it. I had to bring human feeling and emotion into the story. Well, here comes Minnie standing on a box, pooping on a pair of socks, up in the sky and down on the ground. None of children can be found. I could make dances. I could show that the children had dreams, that they had a fantasy world, like, like all children do. And so the dream dance showed the possibilities showed them as real children, even though it was distorted by the fact that while they were playing, they were still doing those things that they did when they were at work. In the machine dance, they were to move as if they were parts of a machine, as if they were robots. So they move around on the stage like that, and I wanted to show that you simply cannot do that to human beings, that they will insist on being alive, on being humans, and having feelings. And so Bonnie and Nellie break away from the group and move towards each other and show that they care about each other. One person I especially wanted to research was Mother Jones. She was a great American hero, and she was also involved in struggles for working people's rights, including children. But it seemed to me that it would be fitting to put her into the theater piece, to be the adult in the lives of these children in Broken Bow. When Mother Jones was a young woman, her name was Mary Harris, she moved to Memphis, Tennessee to get a job as a school teacher. 
And while there, she met George Jones, a young iron worker, and they fell in love and got married. They had four children and were very happy. They worked hard and they had high hopes for their future and the future of their family. But everything was cut short when a yellow fever epidemic hit Memphis. And one by one, Mary watched her children get sick and die. And George died too. After Mary had buried her family, she put a few things together and moved to Chicago. And when she was there, she set herself up in a dressmaking business. And she would sit for hours in the homes of rich women and sew their clothes. And she would look out of the window at the lakefront and watch the homeless and the poor. But this wasn't going to go on for very long either for Mary because the great Chicago fire happened and burned everything that Mary owned and left her once again with nothing. And it was at that time that she decided to change her life forever. And she said that the whole of the American continent was her home wherever her shoes were, and that all working people were her family. That gives me an idea. The people of America need stirring up again. Ring the bell of liberty. Take the children out on tour. Yeah! It, it was very important to me that I not take advantage of these children, uh, the children in the photographs, that they had already been used by society and that it was my responsibility to honor them, to honor them with a truthful portrayal. And we would combine history and art and come up with something. I was really moved and touched by some photographs. It sent me into a year of working on something that turned out to be wonderful. Everybody has a story that they want to tell. Everybody has things that they care about. Shows can be put on about anything. But when you make a show about something that you really care about, it puts you to the test. It makes you understand things. It makes you know why you care. And it helps other people to understand. And then maybe they'll start to care too.
Up is made possible in part by the West Virginia Humanities Council. It doesn't take long after you begin rehearsing that you realize that acting is a lot more important than just memorizing lines. Your job is to convince the audience that you are your character. No matter if you're speaking, miming, dancing, or acting, you have to use your whole body to show emotions like disappointment. So just like an athlete in training for a sport, we were in training for a performance. Five, six, seven, eight. Each rehearsal began with warm-ups, exercises that stretch and warm up our muscles. At the same time, we were learning the basics of mime. Like if we were miming, swinging a bat, we had to really concentrate to feel the weight of that invisible bat. This was harder than it looks because at the same time, we were learning to count music. Counting music is something most dancers do. trying to develop the muscles of the throat, the sides of the neck, and the back of the neck. If you clunk your head back on your trapezius muscle, which is the muscle on either side, that, that it's like a triangle. It goes all the way out to here and up to your skull. Don't clunk your head back on that muscle. It will feel awful. Oh, it's awful, right, OK? Take your head up and away. Lift it up. When you work on just one part of your body, it's caught in isolation. For this isolation, Drew caught out directions and we tried to follow. Each wall in this studio had a number. Up, down, circle, up, two, floor, four, up, slow down, Amy, and up, four, floor, two, up, four, notches. Isolations, like any other exercise, don't do you much good unless you do them correctly. Now look over there and start your eyes coming up. That's it. Lift this up. That's right. That's it. Keep this good. That's right. Now lift your head back up to the front and you'll feel muscles here. Use these muscles. That's right. Okay. Ra otherwise, see, go like this. some exercises that we did not look forward to. Are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. When you go down, bring your knees up to your chest, okay? Like this. You should be like this. That's where you're making your mistake. You keep going over. If you end up like that, see, you're in trouble. Let your head stay down on the floor, too. A lot of you were lifting your head up. Just let it stay on the floor. I washed the floor after Christmas, so it's clean. After Christmas? Yes, it's clean. Make it look like somebody has just blown you over, and that's what's making you roll. You're not rolling because you want to roll. Judith said things in rehearsal that later came true in the play. We really were blown away by the mean boss. So little by little, we began to find out why we did each exercise. Each and every person will go around the building and find an object to touch. Close your eyes and move it in your hand so that you can really feel it. Then open your eyes and look at it and then come back in here, okay? No, don't bring it in here. Yes, you can feel your mom. <laughs> oh. 
When you're done, come back in. I'd like you to close your eyes now and make the shape of what you were feeling before. And really feel it. Be quiet. Close your eyes. The whole shape. Take your time. Take your time. Imagine that you're seeing it. Concentrate. Keep going. Keep going. Concentrate. We used a lot of miming to show the jobs of our characters, like shucking oysters, selling newspapers on the street corner, or changing the bobbin in a big cotton mill. To teach us a dance called the minuet, we began by stretching and holding. And hold, hold. Okay, relax for a second. I hear noises, I hear a noise like this. Now, when you make a noise like that, when you make a noise like that, it means that you're holding your breath. And when you do something hard, you need more breath than less. Okay, so what you have to do is try to untrain yourself from squeezing down on your breathing when you do something that's difficult. You turn your hands up and look at wall one. Turn your hands down and look at your left hand. And turn your hands up and look at wall one. This dance was counted in threes, so we learned how to clap to the beat. Now the one is a bigger step than the others. One, two, three, one, two, three. Four. Then we learned how to move our legs to the beat. Finally, we got to see Jude put all these movements together and dance a simple minuet. After watching Jude easily do it, we thought, what's the big deal? We can do that, no problem. And left. Big problem, this was harder than it looked. It was really hard putting the arm and head movements together with the leg movements. I never felt so uncoordinated in my whole life. Okay, everybody come out here. Right, left. Okay, do it without me now. Go. Right, left. Jude up. thought it might be easier to learn in a circle. Back, After two, about 10 minutes, we were still having big problems. This is awful. Everybody practice it. Let go of your partners and do it on your own. Next, we tried Five, it in a line. Six. One, two, three, lift. And a back, two, three, tsh, and forward. Aha, you see? Sometimes it seemed like we were getting it, but I began to so feel like we would never learn the minuet. Count. Try it again. It's, it's better, it's better, it's better. That's what we like, is that it gets better and better. It took us about three weeks to learn all the choreography in the minuet. At this rehearsal, some of us began wearing our costume shoes. Our costumes were authentic, dating back to a time when many kids worked eight-hour days instead of going to school. The idea of the minuet in Broken Bow was that here we were, poor, uneducated, working kids, dancing as if we were in a royal court. It was one of our dreams, and this was a dream of something that would never be in our reach. a rhyme called Mina Dina. We thought it was a voice exercise, a tongue twister. Mina Dina died and dust, cattle of rain, a wine, a wash, spit, spot, must be done, twiddle, twaddle, twenty-one. But then Jude put a movement to each word. Hey, Mina Dina died and dust, cattle of rain, a wine, a wash, Mm-hmm. 
must be done. Try it to the left. Little by little, we learned each movement for each part of the rhyme. To the right. Spit, spot. <laughs> okay. When we had trouble with a movement, Jude repeated it over and over again until we got it. <laughs> then it was on to the next section. Finally, we tried it with music. do it all the way through, but we have to set this first. Listen to the music. Don't speed up. It's hard. I mean, it's hard to go slow, and it's hard to go fast, and it's hard, it's hard, hard, hard. But the, the, the music tells you what to do. The music is what's going to keep you all together, all right? Maybe once you get started, you can stop the Mina Dina. Eventually, we did drop the words all together. So why did we learn the rhyme? Well, we learned the rhyme as a way to remember the movement, and it worked. In the play, the character Moni shows us the dance, and we all beg her to teach it to us. the first to learn the dance, and she shows it off. Then we all join in. amazing amount of work to learn all the dances and all the movements of Broken Bow. And now I know that if I work hard, I can do just about anything. We'll go and see the president. is made possible in part by the West Virginia Humanities Council.
this is how we did it. If you can imagine walking into a theater and the stage is right there in front of you, the curtains are open, and you don't know if the thing that you came to see has started yet, all you see is one lone figure, a woman, and she has a little baby. Up behind the woman on a gigantic screen is projected a slide. Sometimes it'll project words and sometimes the photographs that Lewis Hine had taken of the children. And I wanted these children to appear to come to life and speak to us. The children in the photographs are very tired and they're, they're dirty. Uh, some of them have lint in their hair and on their faces or grease or coal dust and uh, so we used makeup on the actors so that they would have those kinds of marks on their faces. The marks of work and fatigue and fear. For the two boys who worked in the mines, we had to find miners' hats. Now, when these boys worked in the mines, their hats were soft, which is pretty scary because if something fell on their head, they'd get hurt. The hats had oil in little lamps that uh, got lit. A wick was put into the lamp, and, and these hats were lit because they worked in the dark and they had to be able to see. And this, of course, was very dangerous because there was a lot of gas in the mines. And we were fortunate in finding a hat at the Exhibition Coal Mine in Beckley, West Virginia. Mine's the cleanest shirt ever! Mine's the dirtiest. The costumes, now we got these new costumes. Some of them were bought at old stores and some costumes were donated. We wanted them to look really old and used. So Robin would wash them over and over and over again. Uh, she would stomp them down in the mud and walk on them. Uh, we smeared them up with grease and grime to make them look old and used. Well, the costume doesn't smell good. <laughs> Most of the time, when I get a theater idea, it's a mask idea. People all over the world love and use masks, and always have. They're part of religions, they're part of celebrations, they're part of rituals of all kinds. People will make masks out of all different kinds of materials. They can be carved out of wood, or paper pressed into molds. Beads can be pressed into wax that spread over wood. And you can make mass out of cloth the way that we do at Harvard. The first step is to make a plaster cast of the person's face. So that the plaster won't stick, Jude carefully puts a lot of Vaseline on Zayla's face. Her eyebrows and eyelashes get extra Vaseline. Nothing's going to stick to your face, I'll tell you. Left eye first. Are you ready? To keep the person calm and relaxed, Jude talks in a very soft but reassuring voice. Go away. Try not to smile. Don't Hi. smile, okay? Try harder. Get real serious. Okay. You okay in there? Jude uses a special cloth that is coated with a quick drying plaster. Okay. Well, I'm going to put a piece across your forehead. She looks like she has sunglasses on. Yeah. 
Don't make her smile. Okay, when I push this against your forehead, honey, push forward just a little okay. bit. Okay, here we go. Push. Now relax. Good girl. It won't get in your mouth because I put lots of Vaseline on it. Here we go. Can you breathe? Mm-hmm. Good. Eventually, everything will be covered except for Sailor's two nostrils. Even though Jude uses quick drying plaster and works quickly, the bandages will be on Sailor's face for about 30 minutes. You can see why you wouldn't want to do this if a person had a cold. And you have all this stuff on your face and you can still breathe. It's amazing. You just really need your nose, huh? After two layers, the plaster begins to dry. Mariah's going to feel it. Don't be shocked. As the plaster dries, a chemical reaction takes place. This heats up the cast. <laughs> feels like mm. she has a fever. When I count to three, you pull your head back, and I'll push the mask off your face, okay? Are you ready? Mm-hmm. After it dried, Jude had Sailor smile and frown to loosen up the cast. One, two, three. <sighs> Here you are. Okay, Mariah will help you get more. Can I look at it? Yeah, sure. Then Jude covers the last part, the breathing holes that she couldn't cover when it was on Sailor's face. It soaked into my face. Oh, yeah? The plastic? And then it got heavy. Yeah, it looked like it was heavy. I was like... But this is not the finished mask. Jude uses it as a mold, filling it with plaster. You didn't need those, too, I think. When this plaster dries, the original bandages that were on Sailor's face are ripped off. Mm -hmm. And another good one. And you get it all off. Yep. Let's see what we've got here. Back to the edges. Oh, Ooh, this feels weird. That was the first That's one. That's the first one. Some of the Vaseline from Sailor's face keeps the first layer from sticking. There, oh, there she is. Ooh, Sailor, there you are. This copy of Sailor's face is now ready to sit patiently while the mask is made. Here, look right at it, Sailor. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Not only are the plaster copies more patient, but they also let the mask makers do things that you couldn't do to a live face. Like this. Jude's building a snout. Turning Sailor's face into some kind of animal. Using a sandwich of aluminum foil and clay, a nose is cut out. And go right down like that. Finally, we're almost ready to make the mask. The foil will keep the mask from sticking. The mask will be made out of this lightweight cloth. This is starch, the stuff they use to make shirts stiff. You can start to see what will happen, from the snout up to above Sailor's eyes. Everywhere there is clay, the mask will not touch her face. All the parts that have no clay will be touching her face. After it dries for a few days, the mask is cut off the plaster and clay face. It still doesn't look like any animal that I know but Jude has a lot of decorating to do. But first the fit is checked on the real sailor. Now, put your chin down. Is that comfortable? Mm -hmm. It's okay? Okay, now look up and put your fingers where your eyes are. Not your doggy's eyes, your eyes. I know. Remember that clay was put over the plaster cast eyes. So the poodle's eyes are actually going to be up there. 
sailor is going to look through these holes here and no one will notice. Now that Jude tipped you off that it's a poodle mask, you can probably figure out that she'll be adding a lot of fur. But first she paints the parts that won't have any fur. Ears are cut out of fur. Then different colored fur is sewn onto the mask. Finally, the eyes are glued in. The audience will look into the poodle's eyes and won't notice the eye slits underneath that Sayla will look through. The poodle mask is done. There are easier ways to make masks, but doing it this way makes masks that are comfortable and really fit. This mask wasn't meant to be a serious dog, but it wasn't just any dog. It was the president's dog. It was very important that the audience be given a break. The story was so sad. The children's situation was so desperate. And I knew that I had to inject a moment of, of happiness, a moment of laughter. And the poodle mask was a way to do that. So that all of the time that we spent on the poodle, was for a moment of laughter. And that moment of laughter was very, very important. I used masks and broken bow because I wanted the audience to think about child labor. I wanted them to feel for the children. And that's why we made every effort to make the children appear to be real. They came out of the photographs and spoke. They did not wear masks. The only time a child wore a mask was when she or he had to portray an adult. All of the adults who moved around on the stage were masked because I wanted them to make the audience think and not feel. Think about what was happening to the children who were real. is made possible in part by the West Virginia Humanities Council.
to have something messy on the stage. We want to be able to be done on Sunday, March the 4th. Wake up in the morning and know that we have done the best job we could possibly do. We don't want to lie there and think of all the things that went wrong. So today we rehearse and rehearse and rehearse and do it over and over and over again. Okay, now, as you come through, you're leaning forward and that means that you have to use the muscles in the back of your neck to hold your face up so that as you come through, we see happy smiling faces. We don't see happy smiling tops of heads. All right, tops of heads don't communicate a whole lot. What is it that you're trying to communicate in this dance? We're happy. We're happy. You are happy. How does somebody can communicate smile. that? Smile. smile. We have to see the smiles. Ring the bell of liberty and sing another song. Smiley, 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 smiley. Come on now, right this shoulder. What are you looking at? And face it. I see the top of your head too much. Back again. Five, six, seven, eight. Ring the bell of liberty and sing another song. Sing it with us. <laughs> worked on Broken Bell, it made me not so shy. It was working with everybody else and helping everybody else. We made lots of friends. I think being in a play does make a person more open because then, I mean, if they're not shy here, why be shy at school? What peripheral vision is, is when you look straight ahead and you can see what's out to the side. Two people at the side of you walk up behind your back and you, you can't look at them, but you know they're coming up. And when you see them in your peripheral vision, you kneel down. It's like you can't focus on them. You have to focus on something straight in front of you. I think the peripheral vision exercise helped me in my acting because on stage, if I would be dancing, I couldn't run into anybody else. I have to look at the audience, but I have to know where I am, and I can't look at anybody else while I'm dancing. So I have to know where everybody is on the stage or I'll ram into them. The stage is going to be very big. And if you scatter all over the stage, people will have to turn their heads and not look at some of the people. What we want is for everybody on the stage to be seen. Because the audience, too, has peripheral vision, right? So they may focus on Moni, but they can see the rest of you. Your eye contact with other people, just like the peripheral vision that you use, is very, very important. Please now start to work on really making sure that you are making eye contact and communicate with that person through your eyes. You're going to look at each other right in your eyes the night of the performance and you're going to be able to support each other because you'll remember all these times that you looked into each other's eyes and came across the floor. <coughs> this butter's bitter. If I put it in my batter, it will make my batter bitter. So I think that Jude tried to trick us at the beginning, but we didn't realize it that she was giving us all this fun stuff to do, but we'd have to say poems and she'd make us like sound out the words like if it was things, we'd have to make sure that the S came out and so like the audience could hear us. Want a bit of better butter. When you handed out our lines, I was like, I'm never gonna learn these. Every night I would um, memorize at least two lines. <laughs> um, and then eventually I started to know it and I think the voice exercises really helped. We said them to each other, then we hit our paper and said them. Then if we messed up, we'd look at our paper again and we just kept saying them. After the play was over, I realized that wasn't a lot of lines. 
Myrtle, lines, repeat your lines. Angelica, lines, repeat your lines. Mamie, repeat your lines. Lottie, go slower. Addie. Sometimes during notes, Judy would tell us that we were throwing away our lines. That means that we were letting the words trail off at the end of the sentences. Or speaking whole sentences as if we didn't care what we were saying. Michael, say his line. Vance, say the word draw like you mean it. And Arthur, don't go too fast. Don't throw away your lines. Remember, just because you know them doesn't mean the audience knows them. The audience does not know them. And the audience didn't come to see a practice. An audience came to see the show. Finished. There are people going, ah, uh, in, ah, uh, uh, don't make the audience worry about your safety and your sanity. They didn't come to worry about you, the actor. They came to worry about you, the character. Looking like my character, Arthur, was not easy because he walked with a twist. He had like a twist in his spine because one leg was longer than the other. I often just tried to do it by habit. Sometimes I did it so well by habit, at school I almost found myself walking like Arthur. There were one or two gestures that I did to portray Lily, and one of them was that she had her hand up by her collar, and Jude told me that she saw other pictures with Lily's hand up by her collar, and it was a mystery. It might have been because she was shy, and she just liked to have her hand up there, or if it was like a habit or something. I don't think it was because she got hurt because then she couldn't do the job that she did. It was fun to pretend you were another person, but it also um, gives you the thoughts of how sad she was. I can sort of understand how she felt by playing her part, um, but I never really worked as hard as she did. I don't work as hard as she did. I go to school. She doesn't go to school. She works, and she probably longs to go to school. I sit down in the tunnel in the dark and wet. I listen for the mules and then open and shut the door for them. It's dark, but I draw anyways. I take me a piece of stone, and I draw on the doors. Fancy stuff. I love drawing them birds. I make them flying out in the air, free-like. Lots of them for company. The last few weeks of rehearsal gave us a hint of what it must have been like for those kids. All we did was go to school, rehearse, and then sleep. There wasn't much time for fun, but we managed to fit in some. Then it was back to work. You all have improved to a certain point with your eyes and your self-control, and now it's not getting any better. Dolls were rehearsing with us. Jenny Hawker was going to sing the songs of Broken Bow. <laughs> Michael Martin will narrate the show. Just stand it up, put your feet under your butt, keep them there, and keep it straight, that's all. Let me get my lines out before you holler. 
Lois McLean will be Mother Jones' voice. And Bill Willington will play all the music. All the adults really understood Broken Bow, and they made a lot of suggestions. Those dances make you guys machines, and precision is really, really important that you're all just kind of like little automaton robots at that point, okay? So we will work, I really want to spend time working on those to make them better. Let's just try it one time. Lift your finger when, when you know it's time to start, okay? Here's a four, here's a four beat time. I mean, right on the beat, okay? Listen to the count, and you'll get it. We are about to have our last rehearsal at Hartwood with costumes, props, everything. The performance seemed real. In less than two days, it would finally happen. Most of us were ready, but we were all a little nervous. How old are you, Joe? Eleven. What job of work do you do in the glass factory? I'm a carrying in boy. The first half hour of Broken Bow was where we had to say our longest and hardest lines. We weren't going to use microphones, so we had to say everything loud and it was really important to say your lines like you believed them. And we make lots of forget-me-nots. What do you do, Angelica? I pull the petals open and put the ball in the middle, and I glue it to the stem. You do that over and over? Over and over. What made it easier was that we knew a lot about our characters. During the happy parts of Broken Bow, uh, I think that Angelica probably thought that her dream had come true. There was somebody that had come and made her dream come true, like her fairy godmother or something like that. Most of us felt best about the dancing. By now, it felt like our bodies knew what to do. But you still had to really concentrate. We all felt like we were a part of something big. We were all working together, and that was the best feeling. <laughs> 47 hours from now, we were going to be doing this in front of 600 people. 600 people. Wow. is made possible in part by the West Virginia Humanities Council. Good citizens, 
Please tell me how we could allow such things to be the cradle rocking in our tree has fallen with the broken at the Alexandria Glass Factory in Alexandria, Virginia. How old are you, Joe? Eleven. What job of work do you do in the glass factory? I'm a carrying in boy. They call us boys carrying pigeons. And what do carrying in boys do? I carry glass on a great big shovel made of something called asbestos. Take it from the bench to a special oven to cool. See, it's got to cool just slow enough or it'll break. I don't get paid for the glass that breaks, and I can't drop in either or it gets took from my pay. How much is your pay? If I do everything right, I can get 72 cents a day. Do you ever work at night? I work day shift one week, night shift the next. I used to think glass was pretty. Me and my friends called it ice stone. Did you ever go to school? Before I started working. Do you want to go back to school? Yeah, I do. And why do you want to go back? I want to learn something. Hey, Arthur. Where is it you work? Turkey knob mine. Where is that? M McDonald, West Virginia. How come you walk that way, Arthur? Oh, I fell once and got hit by a car hauling coal. Twisted me up, but it don't slow me down none. Hey, I've been told there was a king once named Arthur. That true? Yeah. King Arthur of England. England? That near here? You work at Turkey Knob? Yeah, same as Arthur. Our daddy's works here too. What's your job, Vance? I'm a trapper boy. Or I never stop calls me. I work 10 hours every day and I get 75 cents for it. And what is it you do all day, Vance? I sit down in the tunnel in the dark and wet. I listen for the mules and then open and shut the door for them. You get lonesome down there? Well, yeah, I guess. I can't see none too good down there. It's so dark. And the rats makes me nervous. Is there anything at all you can do while you're down there? You see, I can draw real good. It's dark, but I draw anyways. I take me a piece of stone, and I draw on the doors. Fancy stuff. I love drawing them birds. I make them flying out in the air, free-like. Lots of them for company. I'm not tired. It's my sister who's tired. Your sister? What does she do? She's a spinner too, but she's on the night shift and works for 12 hours. The light been real bad. My sister come out in the morning from the mill and she sees threads, threads, threads. She go home and sleep and then jump up and say, oh my eyes, my eyes is all threads. Her back hurt, too. She stand and stand all night. Can you read, Pearlie? No, not really <coughs> how. I'm Lily Anderson. I live in South Carolina. I work at the Newberry Mill. What's it like, Lily, working at the mill? Well, when I first went to work at the mill, the long standing up hurt my feet, and my back pained me all the time. 
Mother cried when I told her how I felt. And that made me feel so bad that now I don't tell her anymore. Little boys are employed to change the bobbins on the machines. They're called doffers. Many of them are so young that they have to climb onto the machines to do their job. This is Willie Long. He's a doffer boy at the bid mill number one, Macon, Georgia. I'm Lizzie Davis. I'm nine years old and we're out with the Latin Treasure Mills from Mountain, Tennessee. I work 12 hours and get 60 cents every day. 12 hours. That's a long time, Lizzie. Do you stop to eat or rest? No, they don't like us to stop. We don't stop to get our dinner. We eat a workin'. Boss says the machines don't stop. Why should we? It's hard for me. I get tired. <coughs> and the candles are always worse when I'm tired. The boss says he'll fire me if I don't do any better. Who's that hiding behind your back, Moni? Oh, this is Minnie Love. She's upset. She's too little to be working. She gets in trouble because she always goes over to the window and opens it up. They always keeps it closed. Hey, Minnie, how come you keep opening the window? Because it smells good out there. And I can see men out there playing, hitting a ball with long sticks down on the green grass over the hill. And then a play in golf, Minnie. Oh. Is it hard work, Eddie? Well, it's mostly my eyes. My eyes hurt always from watching the threads. Sometimes I see threads everywhere. When I look at other things, I see threads running across them. Sometimes those threads seem to be cutting into my eyes. This is little Lottie. She's a regular oyster shucker at the Alabama Canning Company. She speaks no English. Work begins at 3 a.m. and ends at 5 p.m. The boss says the work must be done by such a schedule because the product is perishable. Are not these children perishable? Do you like working with your sisters, Mamie? Sometimes, if my sisters are feeling good, while we work, we sing to each other. But lots of times they get very quiet. Then I don't know what to do with my mind. What do you do then? I just watch the needle go in and out, up and down, sewing zippers on pants for Mr. Centray. What do you do, Angelica, at the table with your mama and your brother and sisters? We make flowers. Well, what kind of flowers? Forget-me-nots. A man comes and brings us a great big box with pieces of paper flowers and wires and things, and we make lots of forget-me-nots. What do you do, Angelica? I pull the petals open and put the ball in the middle, and I glue it to the stem. You do that over and over? Over and over. I'm out there first day. I stay out six hours, and then I go back again at night. Do you sell all the papers you go out with? I try to, because I don't get money for the papers I don't sell. I work the last paper scheme. The last paper scheme? <laughs> What's that, Myrtle? Well, you see, I hide my pile of papers in an alley, and then I take just one of them, and I hold it up high, and I holler, this is my very last paper. Won't you please buy my last paper? And then I can go home. You sell many papers that way? Yeah. Parts of the monster, things that turn.
the ballad of Mary Harris. There were George and Mary Jones in their budding family. There was Catherine and Elizabeth, young Terence and Baby. But through the streets of the city ran an open sewer, the perfect breeding ground for an epidemic. And then in the spring of 1867, millions of mosquitoes who hatched in these pools descended upon the people of Memphis, infecting them with yellow fever. Hundreds of people throughout the city died. Across the street from George and Mary Jones, 10 people lay dead. And then the dread visitation came to their house as first Catherine, and then Elizabeth, young Terence, and the baby all sickened and died. One by one, she washed their little bodies and prepared them for burial. And then George came down with the disease. Four days later, he was dead, leaving Mary alone in her grief. And no one came to comfort her. No one could come. Other homes were stricken as well. And all day long, all day long, night through, night through, she heard the grating of the wheels of the death cart on the streets of the city. And Mary Harris Jones rising up from tragedy the children of the working class as her own true family. What's your name, little girl? Pearly Turner. What's yours? You may call me Mother. I went down to Cottondale, Alabama, to get a job in the cotton mills. I wanted to see for myself if the gruesome tales of little children working in the mills were true. I applied for a job, but the manager told me he had nothing for me unless I had a family that would work too. I told the manager that I was going to move my family to Cottondale, but I had come on ahead to see what chances there were for getting work. Do you have children? Yes, there are six of us. Five. was so enthusiastic that he went with me to find a house to rent. Here's a house that will do plenty. The house he brought me to was a sort of two-plank shanty. The windows were broken and the door sagged in. Its latch was broken. Through the cracks in the roof, the rain had come in and rotted the flooring. He was delighted with the house. The wind and the cold will come through these holes. Oh, summer will be here soon, and you'll need all the air you can get. I don't think this house is big enough for six of us. 
Not big enough? What do you all want? A hotel? There is such a thing as too much education for working people sometimes. I've seen cases where young people are spoiled for labor by too much refinement. at improved child labor laws. Some people are born to work with their brains, and some are born to work with their hands. Look at these. They are not fitted to do anything else.
a century ago rang out for freedom from tyranny is touring the country and crowds are coming to see it everywhere. That gives me an idea. The people of America need stirring up again. Ring the bell of liberty. Take the children out on tour. Yeah! President. We want President Roosevelt to hear the wail of the children who never have a chance to go to school but have to work 8, 10, 12 hours a day in the textile mills, who weave the carpets that he walks on and the lace curtains in his windows who shuck the oysters and carry in the glass, shiver in the mines and sweatshops, and sell goods on the streets of America. Perhaps he would like to compare them to his own little ones who are vacationing with their poodles on Oyster Bay.
It's a letter from President Roosevelt's secretary. Dear Madam, I beg to acknowledge the receipt of your letter and to say that it has been brought to the President's attention. Under the Constitution, it is not at present seen how Congress has power to act in such a matter. It would seem that the states alone at present have the power to deal with the subject. The president did not grant the interview. And that was what we asked for. The letter drops us down, as they think, in a manner which disarms us. But I serve notice that the matter is not dropped here. I make them flying out in the air, free like, lots of them, for company. America, please tell me how we could allow such things to be. The Here. 